Hi there, welcome to lecture five. We're going to be talking about induction or proving for all. Now, let me mention that, you know, induction is one of humanity's greatest inventions. And so, you know, if you can master it early, you're in good shape. And it's a real bombshell for computer science because lots of algorithm design techniques are fundamentally dependent on induction. Recursive algorithms, on dynamic programming, greedy algorithms, and the list goes on. So, you know, you know get a hold of indu induction early. And, you know, all the lectures we've had so far, I'm going to say are very important. You discrete objects, saying things precisely, basic ideas of proof. But it takes something special to bring Orange Malik out. And so this lecture is going to be, you know, given by Orange Malik. And this means that thing, you know, Orange Malik is a little bit more wild, is a little bit more uh, energetic, is a little bit more eccentric. And so, you know, you know, that's because this lecture is so important. But to slow me down, I'm going to have to get onto the board. Okay, before we go to the board, let's uh, have a quick recap of what we did last lecture. We were talking about proofs, in particular, you know, how to prove if-then, and also if and only if, equivalence, okay? And we introduced proof patterns for if-then. So the most common is the direct proof, and we did some examples of that. So where you assume that the left-hand side of the if-then is true, and prove the right-hand side. Contraposition is also equally powerful, and this is more appropriate when, you know, it's clear that if the right-hand side of the if-then is false, then the assumption on the left hand side is also clearly false. Okay, so that's when you would want to use contraposition. And try your hand at contraposition to show that if you have an irrational number r, then it's squ it's square root, so square root of r must also be irrational. Okay, so the square root of an irrational number is irrational. Try to prove that with direct proof. It's a little bit hard. Try to prove it with contraposition, no problem. Okay, then we're talking about this all-powerful technique, contradiction. Okay, you can use it to prove anything. You start by assuming that whatever you're trying to prove is false. If you enter this world where it's false, you explore, and in your exploration, if you come to a contradiction, something fishy, it means that that world cannot exist. That world where you assumed it was false cannot exist. Okay? And so you conclude that whatever you were trying to prove is true. Okay, we use that to prove that the square root of 2 is irrational. Okay, we use that to prove that for any integers a and b, you cannot arrange it so that a squared minus 4b is equal to 2. Okay? And you can try your hand at this uh, reasonably you know, ugly looking formula, you know, where you know, we're saying that the twice the square root of n plus 1 over the square root of n plus 1 is less equal to twice the square root of n plus 1. Okay, it's just a mathematical formula. Try to prove it. Okay, one easy, the, the, the one, one, one relatively straightforward way to prove it, and go ahead and do it, is to assume it's false and come up with nonsense. And once you come up with nonsense, boom, it must be true. Okay, so what's the plan for today? The plan for today is to talk about induction, this greatest you know, invention of humanity. So what is induction? Why do we need it? Okay, and we'll summarize all this stuff into sort of a, a, a proof technique called induction. It allows us to prove for all. Okay, and then we'll do lots of examples. And, at the, and, and, and we'll finish up with the link between induction and the well-ordering principle. Now, the well-ordering principle was this very basic uh, self-evident principle we introduced okay, that allowed us, for example, to show that the square root of 2 is irrational. Okay, but this, power, this principle is so powerful. It turns out that it's equivalent to induction. So in, in essence, the well-ordering principle is the justification of induction. So if you're wondering whether induction is a valid thing to do, then you know you just need to appeal to the well-ordering principle, and that actually can prove the proof technique of induction. Okay, so we'll show you that link by showing you that you know whatever you can prove with induction, you can prove with well-ordering, and vice versa. That means that whatever you can prove with induction is valid because the well-ordering principle we took it for granted. Okay, um, so let's begin. Okay, so as with all things math. Uh, to learn induction, the best way is to practice. Okay, so let's start with an example that is going to illustrate the essence of induction. Okay, so you know when I was uh, uh, you know in, in college, you know in the student union, there was a postage machine. Okay, and you know when we started writing this book uh, in 2015, the postage on the uh, on the postcard was 34 cents. So, and um, today it's 35 cents. Okay, so now you think about this postage machine in the student union in 2015, it would need to stock. 34 cent stamps if you're going to uh, allow students to send postcards. Okay, but who sends postcards today? But anyway, you know, play along. Um, and today, you'd have to take out all the 34 cent stamps and put in 35 cent stamps. Okay, that's a big hassle. So, question Is there a way for the postage machine, in some sense, to adapt to changing postage without us having to refill it with different denominations of postage every year? Okay, so here's a bright idea. Bright idea. Okay, fill the postage machine with five and seven cent stamps. Okay, so fill with an essentially unlimited supply. You know, unlimited supply of five cents and and seven cent stamps. Okay, 
So, you know, this is not 34 cents, this is not 35 cents, but the idea is sort of clear. When I need to do, you know, whatever postage I, I need to do, you know, I can, um, you know, get the relevant number of five and seven cent stamps that I need and post, uh, put them together on the envelope and I'm done. Okay, so let's see how this works. Okay, so let's say I want 19 cents. And, and now we're playing around to see if this works for the postage machine. So this is tinker. So let's tinker. Okay, 19 cents. How do we make 19 cents? Okay, so no problem. I'm gonna do um, seven, seven, and five. So 14 and five, 19. Easy. Okay, how do I make 20 cents? 20 cents. Well, that's also easy. Five, 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 five. What about 21 cent? How can I make a postage of 21 cent? That's also easy. Seven, seven, seven. And things are looking great. Okay, 22 cents. What about 22 cents? 22 cents. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. I can, uh, I can do, you know, five, 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 and then a seven. Five, five, five. Okay, and then a seven. Okay, so 15 plus seven, 22 cents. Oh, things are looking great. Looks like, you know, I have succeeded in, you know, filling my machine once and for all with five and seven cent stamps, and I'm done. Just unlimited supply of five and seven cents. Whatever you need, you can get out of the postage, out of the postage machine. Okay, well, but we come to 23 cents. Okay, and hmm, how do we make 23 cents? So pause the video and see if you can come up with a way to make 23 cents, and you will find that it's not virtually impossible. It's impossible with five and seven cent stamps. And, and, and this is a problem for my postage machine. Okay. Um, and, and, and we, we could consider ourselves doomed and done at the moment, but you know, we realize that postage is way above 23 cents. We don't need to make 23 cents. We only need to make 34 cents and higher because the postage is never going to drop below uh, the postage of a postcard, which is 34 cents. So we only need, need 34 cents and higher. Okay. So, you know, this is not so bad. It's bad because the postage machine cannot do 23 cents, but we don't need 23 cents. So let's keep going. 24 cents. Hmm. 24 cents. How do we make 24 cents? Well, you know, we were able to make 19 cents. So let's just add four cents. Seven, seven, you know, uh, five. Sorry, let's just add five cents. So seven, seven, five, five is 24. What about 25? Or well, 25 is easy. Okay, that's just five, 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 five. What about 26? 26 is also just as easy. Okay, so let's do seven, 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 five. Okay, what about 27? 27 cents. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so 27 is, you know, so I can do five, 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 and a seven. Five, 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 and seven. Okay, so this is 20 plus 7. What about 28? Hmm, 28 cents. Ah, 7, 7, 7, 7. Hmm. Okay, very interesting. And Okay, so, you know, what about 29? 29 cents. And, you know, 30 cents. And you know, so on. But I'm now getting tired. Okay. Um, because things are looking great. Okay, I'm getting tired. And I'm actually ready at this point to claim okay, that I can do anything above 23. So I am ready to claim I can do any postage above uh, 23 cents. And you might wonder, what? How can you claim that? Any? You've only checked up to 28. You haven't gone up to any. You know? how, how, how do you know that when you get up to uh, 1,023 cents, if, you know, for, you know, for whatever reason, the postage on a postcard is 1,023 cents, well, how do you know at 1,023 cents you'll be able to do it? Because, look, 23 failed. Okay. But I claim that I'm absolutely 100% certain that I can do 1,023 cents. In fact, I can do anything. Okay. Now, I want to illustrate for you the idea without making it precise or formal or, 
or structured in any way. Okay, so in order to make it, in order to make the idea clear, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how I can do 29, 30, 31 cents, 32 cents, 33 cents. Okay, and then you know there's 34, 35, and so on. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a nice thick line here and a nice thick line here. Okay, I'm gonna put another nice thick line here. Okay, and you'll see why the thick lines. I could have made it blue, but I wanna make it thick. Okay, so, you know, how do I do 29 cents? Okay. And how am I, I claim it's easy, because look, I could do 24 cents, and 29 is just five plus 24, so whatever I manage to do here, just add a five. So, I'm gonna write this as 24 plus five, and I have five cent stamps, and I could do 24. Okay, what about 30? Well, 30 is 25 plus 5. 25 plus 5. And because I could do 25, I can do 30 by adding a 5 cents. Well, what is 31? It's 26 plus 5. 26 plus 5. And the key thing here is the 5. I know that I have a 5 cent stamp, so I can always add 5. Okay. And what about 32? Well, that's 27 plus 5. Okay. And well, what about 28? Well, that's no. Sorry, what about 33? Well, that's 28 plus 5. The key thing is the plus 5. And now you see why I have this solid thing here. Because look, I had this group of 5 that I could do, and they were all in a row. And just by adding 5 to each of these, I can do the next group of 5. Hmm. Well, I don't need to stop here. Now I can take this group of 5 and add 5 to each of them and do the next group of five. Okay. So I have the next group of five, I can keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay. And that's the basic idea. This will never stop. I can go all the way to as high a number as I want by just completing groups of five by adding five cents to the previous group of five. And all I needed was this you know, ability to go from one you know, number. So I, I needed this ability to go from being able to solve my problem, i.e. find uh, a way to dispatch, you know, 24 cents with 5 and 7 cents stamps. So I find a way to solve my problem, okay, and I use that way to s solve the problem in order to solve the bigger problem. Okay. And I can keep doing this forever. That is the essence of induction. Okay. If you can show somehow that by solving the problem for some small values, it follows that you can solve the problem for some larger values, then basically you can conclude that you can solve the problem forever, for all values. Okay, now that's very powerful. So we're going to have to put some meat into that. But this stamp postage machine, you know, it contains all the essential intuition for induction. Okay, but we're going to start simple okay, and go systematically step by step through induction. Okay, and, you know, the first step in, 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 in approaching any induction problem is to, to recognize that it's an induction problem. Okay. So, induction. I'm gonna put an exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. So, two important ingredients in an induction problem. The first is that you're trying to prove something for all n. So just like we were trying to prove for the postage machine, we were trying to prove that you can make whatever postage you want for all n. Well, not quite for all n. We were saying for all n bigger than or equal to 24. Okay, so you're making, uh, trying, to prove something for all n. Okay. Let's say, let's say, you know, greater than or equal to something. Let's say greater than or equal to 1. It could be 24, greater than or equal to 24, greater than or equal to 1, greater than or equal to, you know, 10. Okay. The, what you're trying to make it for in terms of, in terms of the lower bound for n is not so important. The important part is you're trying to make it for all n. Okay, greater than or equal to 1 is the typical type of an induction. 
Okay, so you're trying to make, prove something for all n, and you know the starting point is you know for any induction is a predicate. You're trying to prove what? So there's something. Okay, so you have have a predicate. Okay, that. So what is a predicate? So p of n. So this is remember what a predicate does. It returns a statement. So this is a claim that depends on n. Okay. So you're trying to you're, you're asserting that this predicate is true for all n greater or equal to one. So you have a predicate p of n, okay. and this property, this predicate that returns a claim for n, is what you're trying to prove for all n. Okay. So let's look at some examples. Examples. Okay. So I'm going to list the example p of n, and then I'm going to list the claim that we're trying to prove. So, you know, predicate, and then the claim. So what's the predicate? So P of N okay, is the claim. Postage of N can be made with five and seven cent stamps. Okay. That's a perfectly valid claim. Okay. It's a claim that takes as input n okay, and outputs a statement, and that statement can either be true or false. Okay. You can't argue with it that it can be either true or false. Okay. Um, and what's the claim that I'm trying to make here? The claim that I'm trying to make and, and essentially proved when we when we discuss this example is that you know for all n greater or equal to 24. I'm going to assert P of N as true. And it's important, it's for all N. Okay, here's another predicate. So let's call this one. Predicate number two. Okay, P of N okay, is, the, is, the, is the statement, it's the claim that N squared minus N plus 41 is prime. Okay, yeah, that's a claim. So what's P of one? P of one claims that 1 minus 1 plus 41, which is 41, is prime. That's true. Okay. And what's the claim I'm trying to make here? The claim I'm trying to make is that for all n greater than or equal to 1 in this case, I'm going to assert that P of n is true. P of n. So for all n greater than or equal to 1, okay, I'm asserting the claim P of n to be true. Now, when you look at my two criteria for induction to be you know, a plausible approach, you will see that I'm trying to prove something for all. Here's the for all. Here's the for all. Well, you know, we, we in this case for all n bigger than or equal to 24, in this case for all n bigger than or equal to 1. So, but there's a for all. And we have a predicate. Okay. Here's another example. Okay, P of n. 4 raised to the power n minus 1 is divisible by 3. What? It's a predicate. Okay, it says input n and produces a claim, a statement. So, for example, when n equals 1, p of 1 says okay, that 4 to the power 1, which is 4 minus 1, which is 3, so 3 is divisible by 3, clearly true. Okay. And what's the claim I'm making? I'm, I'm going to assert that p of n is true for all n greater or equal to 1. p of n is true for all n greater or equal to 1. I'm going to assert p of n as true. Hmm. Okay. Now, you know, you know, it's fine to assert claims. I can assert whatever I want. Okay. The only question is whether it's true. And that's what we are going to try to establish by proving the claim. And the method of proof is induction. Okay. But let's first see, why do we need induction? Okay. So the first thing you do, so we, we already looked at this claim. So let's look at the other two claims. The first thing you do is to see, at least, for small values of n, are the two claims correct? Tinker. So tinker. So let's consider, in, in both of these cases, we are interested in n greater or equal to 1. Okay, so let's tinker with n, you know, taking on various values, and we'll start at 1, and we'll go up 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Wow, we're energetic. Okay, so we'll go up to 8. Okay, and I'm going to look at, you know, n squared minus n plus 41, n squared minus n plus 41, and I'm going to look at 4 to the n minus 1. Okay, or more specifically, let me look at 4 to the n minus 1 
divided by 3. Why divided by 3? Because I'm interested in whether it's divisible by 3. So if 4 to the n minus 1 divided by 3 is an integer, then, then, then 4 to the n minus 1 is, div is divisible by 3, and that claim is true. Okay, so let's, uh, let's tinker. Let's do these examples. Now I'm going to emphasize then it, when it comes to induction and in general math, tinkering is absolutely essential. Okay. So when n is 1, we already got that this is 41 and 4 to the n minus 1 divided by 3 is 1. Okay, but let's go for higher values. So, so 4 minus 1 is 3 plus 40, uh, 4, 2 squared minus 1 is uh, 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 2 squared minus uh, 2 squared minus 2 is 4 minus 2 plus 41 which is 43 okay that's prime uh, 3 squared minus 3 is plus 41 is 47 and if you plug in 4 you get 53 and if you plug in 5 you get 61 and then you'll get 71 and 83 and you'll even get 97 here and if you want you can go and check that all of these are prime so they're all prime as expected from p of n okay so if we're, if we're claiming p of n is true for all n bigger than or equal to 1, well, it had better be true for at least the first 8n. So it's true, 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 true. Okay. Let's look at 4 to the n minus 1 divided by 3. When n equals 2, we have 15 over 3, so we have here 5. When n equals 3, we have 4 cubed minus 1, so we have 64 minus 1 divided by 3, which is 21. Notice it's an integer. We have 85. You can, com you can compute these numbers. We have 341. We have 1365, we have uh, 5461, and we have 218, uh, 845. Okay, so 4 to the power n minus 1 over 3, always an integer. So check, 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 check. n squared minus n plus 41, always prime. So it looks like we're ready. Okay, so we argued that, okay, this may have been proved, and I gave you the intuition for why. It looks like we're, we're ready to believe this claim, and we're ready to believe this claim. Why? Based on tinkering. Okay. So now I want to emphasize the big flaw. Okay. Tinkering is never a proof. Never. Okay. And let's keep going. And this is why we need induction. We need a rigorous proof. Okay. If you keep going, if you come up to 41... Da, 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 da. If you come up to 41, so n equals 41, look, here you'll have 41 squared minus 41 plus 41. Okay. So you'll have 41 squared. And that's clearly not a prime. And this is the danger with, in, with, with tinkering when it comes to for all. Okay. For all means for all. Tinkering only shows that it's true for some. Okay. And if you stop your tinkering when you get tired, having shown it for some, you cannot conclude for all. Okay. Because maybe later on, okay, it's going to be false, just like here. And, you know, another way of putting that is, okay, you verified it for A, but then you ask yourself the question, am I sure it's true for all? Let me check 9. 9 is true. Oh, am I sure it's... It's true. Let me check 10. And that's going to happen in this case. So we might say, well, we need, you know, verifying up to 8 is not enough. Is verifying up to 41 enough? No, because even 41 is for some, not for all. So here we would verify, okay, good. Then we would check 9, good. Then we would check 10, good. And then we say, can I stop? Oh, well, what about 11? Oh, okay, let's check 11, good. Let's check 12, good. Okay, can I stop? Oh, what about 13? So check 13, da, 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 da. So tinkering and checking slash verifying the claim for some n is never a proof for all n. Okay, it gives you a hint that, you know, this may or may not be true. Uh, okay, but it's, it's sort of a, an inconclusive hint. When it's, when it's true for all up to some value, at least you haven't disproved the claim. But in this case, we disproved it, so we can say, oh, that's false. Okay. Now, how high do we have to go to convince ourselves of this claim? Well, there's no how high. Because no matter how high you go, it's still for some, whatever that high value is. Okay? So we need induction because in order to prove for all, there's no amount of tinkering slash verifying that will suffice. Because you always have this doubt that the next one will fail.
Okay. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go step by step, step through the proof of this guy using induction. Okay. And that's the best way to learn induction, to see and do example after example after example. Okay. So let me, let me erase the board and then we will prove this guy okay. for all n. And there will be no doubt that it is true for all n. Okay, so let's use induction to prove that, uh, you know, that uh, 4 to the power n minus 1 is divisible by 3 for all n greater or equal to 1. So this is exactly the, the claim that we just discussed. Okay, now in order to discuss this claim more formally, let's introduce this predicate that we already had. So P of n is a predicate that takes n and returns the claim, the, the statement 4 to the n minus 1 is divisible by 3. Okay, and you know the claim we're making is that for all n greater or equal to 1, um, P of n, we are asserting that P of n is true. Okay, now I want you to have a couple of analogies in mind as I go through this. Uh, this proof. The first is just an intuitive, you know, get a feeling for induction. Imagine that, you know, you're the, there's a line of people. The first person in, in line is a girl and behind any girl is always a girl. Okay. So we could ask, is there anything but girls in line? Okay. And, you know, where could a boy be? Because the first is a girl, behind that's a girl, behind that's a girl, behind that's a girl. So everyone in line must be a girl. Okay. Here's a more concrete analogy. So, you, you know, when you were you know, all grown up and like 15, you know, you like to assemble dominoes upright on the floor. So you assemble a bunch of dominoes and you painstakingly put the dominoes in a line. Okay. And they're close enough to each other. Let me label the dominoes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we could continue. And you're very proud of yourself. And then, you know, your little brother comes along and tips over this domino and boom, brrr, all the dominoes tip over. So one tips over two, two tips over three, three tips over four, and so on, everything tips. Okay. Now, how do we know that all the dominoes tip? Well, for sure, we know that the first domino tips. Okay, so first domino tips, because that's what your brother did, your mischievous brother. Okay. okay, now, how do we know that all the dominoes tip re relies on, on, on sort of the way in which you, you know, constructed this line of dominoes? You made sure that the dominoes were close enough to each other. So dominoes consecutive dominoes are close enough to each other. Okay, and if the dominoes, if you know that consecutive dominoes are close enough to each other, you tip the first one, we all know that all the dominoes tip. And you don't need to go and verify domino number 757, did you tip? Yes, I can tell you straight away. Because all the dominoes were close enough, and you tip the first one, brrr, starts off a chain reaction. Okay. And induction is exactly that. It's a chain reaction. Okay. So let me show you how that works. Um, so, in our last lecture, you should have proved the following claim. If 4 to the n minus 1 is divisible by 3, and then 4 to the n plus 1 minus 1 is divisible by 3. Now, if you didn't prove this, don't worry. We'll, 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 we'll quickly prove this later on. But hopefully, you exercised your strength in in your muscles in, in direct proof and actually prove this. Okay. But now let me phrase this in the language of my predicate P of n. So this is actually P of n and this is actually P of n plus 1. Okay, And what you have proved, and you, you didn't need to know what n was. So what you have proved is that P of n implies P of n plus 1. And you didn't need to know what n was. So this, this is true for any n. In particular, it's true for all n greater or equal to 1. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so I'm going to show you that, you know, this is a lot of implications all contained in 1. In fact, it's infinitely many implications. For example, there's p of 1 implies p of 2. p of 1 implies p of 2. And p of 2 implies p of 3. So p of 2 implies p of 3. And P of 3 implies P of 4. 
and PO4 implies PO5, and so on. So you see, you set up an infinite chain of implications. Think infinite chain of dominoes. Very similar concept. Okay. Now, what do we know from these implications? Nothing. Okay. And that was the whole idea behind reasoning in the absence of facts. And we're hoping that someday a fact will come to light that will help us actually learn something concrete. Okay, but for the moment, we know nothing. We just know that a bunch of links, a bunch of relationships in, uh, uh, exist. For example, now if someone came and told me P of 3 is true, I can infer that P of 4 is true. Okay. Now, based on our tinkering, you know, we, we saw that P of 1 is the claim 4 to the 1 minus 1 is divisible by 3. And this is clearly true because 4 to the 1 minus 1 is equal to 3, and that's clearly divisible by 3. So P of 1 is true. Ah, we have a new fact, and that fact is going to make this reasoning in the absence of facts all worthwhile. Because look, what this says is that this guy is true. So I'm going to box him. I'm going to box him in blue. That guy is true. Okay, so it's now a known fact. But because that guy is true, and we already proved this implication, P of 1 implies P of 2. And if the left side of an implication is true, we can infer the right side. So we can infer P of 2 is true. But wait a minute. P of 2 is true. So we can infer P of 3 is true. And wait a minute. P of 3 is true. P of 4 is true. You see the chain reaction? Boom, 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 boom. It goes on forever. Just like the chain reaction in the dominoes. In fact, it's basically the same. Okay. The, the equivalent of tipping the first domino, tipping the first domino, the equivalent of that is showing that P of 1 is true. So, show, so establishing that P of 1 is true is analogous to the first domino tipping. Okay. And establishing this link, P of 1 to P of 2, P of 2 to P of 3, P of 3 to P of 4, establishing all those links is exactly equivalent to the, to the requirement that the dominoes must be close enough to each other. That link is the formal definition of close enough. So P of 2 is close enough to P of 1 such that if you tell me P of 1 is true, I can infer P of 2 is true. That's exactly what an implication does. It puts a link that places them close together. Okay. So you see, this set of implications, which set up this infinite chain, which was useless before, once I add the ingredient that this guy is true, boom! All the, predic all the predicates for 1, 2, 3, 4, they all topple and they all must be true. So in a sense, we have proved that all the predicates are true for all n on the right-hand side of this P of 1. Okay. And that's very nicely summarized in the principle of induction. Now, it turns out that the principle of induction, we can prove it, but we won't for the moment. Okay. It can be proved from the well-ordering principle. So I'm just going to state it now. This is the intuition behind the principle of induction. Okay. And we're just going to use it. And then at the end, I'll illustrate to you why you know, the principle of induction and the well-ordering principle are more or less the same by showing you that things we can prove with induction. We don't need induction. We can just use the well-ordering principle. And in fact, you can prove the principle of induction from the well-ordering principle, which, if you're interested, look into the text. Okay. So let me summarize this discussion in the principle of induction. Oh, man. Humanity's greatest invention. Okay. Principle of induction. So, from the very beginning, we must agree that we're working with some predicate P. So, we're working with some predicate P, okay, and I'll just say, so P of N, a predicate. We have a predicate in mind. So, we have, have a predicate. Okay, and then the principle of induction says, so for, for, for this predicate, if you have established P of 1, okay, so, if... You, so you have established established P of 1. Okay, so this is called the base case. Because it's the first thing that you have established. This is called the base case. And you have established or you have proved or you have shown you have proved P of n implies P of n plus 1 for all n greater or equal to 1. So you have proved this in general without knowing anything about n. So you have proved it for any n greater than or equal to 1. 
which is what I assume you proved in the last lecture. Okay. Then, effectively, what the principle of induction says is you set up this chain, and by toppling this P of 1, by establishing this P of 1 to be true, you've set up the chain reaction, and that chain reaction goes and establishes the truth of all the remaining predicates for all n to the right of this one. So what the principle of induction allows you to now do is to conclude, you can conclude by induction, by the principle of induction, that P of n is true for all n greater or equal to 1. That is the principle of induction. Okay, and usually establishing this second step here is called the induction step. Okay. So let me show you, let's get a little bit familiar with the principle of induction by, 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 by showing you a few variants of this. Okay. So remember, so examples, some variants, just so that we sort of understand what's going on. Suppose, so examples. Or variance. Okay, so suppose instead of P of 1, you established P of 5. Okay, and but you also prove that P of n implies P of n plus 1 for all n greater or equal to 1. Okay, so you've established, you know, not quite the base case that was asked for. Okay, but you've established the links, you've established the implication. So let's see what this implication links you know, tell us. They say that P of 1 implies P of 2, implies P of 3, implies P of 4, implies P of 5, implies P of 6, implies P of 7, implies and so on. Well, but unfortunately you didn't establish P of 1, which is what the principle of induction asks for. But you did establish P of 5, so all is not lost, it turns out. So you did establish P of 5. So from P of 5, well, we don't know anything about 1, 2, 3, and 4, but you did establish P of 5, but that's nice. It's not, all, all is not lost because, you know, now P of 5, we know implies P of 6. So you've set up the chain reaction, P of 6 implies 7, and so on. So you've set up the chain reaction. The only difference is it doesn't start at 1, it starts as 5. Okay. Now, if you go and separately manage to prove these guys, then, okay, you've established for all n greater equal to 1. But still, establishing for 5 and then all the links, allows you to prove it for infinitely many n. Okay, that's in interesting. Let's see if we reverse the roles of the 5 and the 1 here. Okay. So suppose, let's see what happens if you proved P of 1, okay, which is what the principle of induction asks for, but you only establish the link for n greater or equal to 5. Okay, so it's a different scenario. Let's, let's, List the links. So anytime you have a situation like this, you can just list the links. See what, what is, the, what is the, the chain that's being set up. So P of 5, n equals 5, implies 6. So P of 5 implies P of 6. And 6 implies 7. And 7 implies 8. And so on. But now here, sitting all alone, hanging around, are P of 4, P of 5, uh, P of 3, P of 2, and P of 1. Okay. Now, You've also established P of 1. So we'll put that in a blue box here to say that, oh, okay, we know that P of 1 is true. But that's not a lot of help anymore, not like the previous case, okay? Because what? From P of 1, there's no link to P of 2 anymore. You haven't established that link. So all you can conclude here is that P of 1 is true. You don't know anything about any of the other guys. So in other words, P establishing P of 1 fails to set up a chain reaction in this scenario. In order to set up the chain reaction, you must establish the truth of one of the propositions, one of the predicates, P of 5, for example, and you must set up all the links. Okay, so that's very important. And usually when, you know, an induction has gone wrong, and you can see some examples in the text, either, so bad induction or induction gone wrong, Either you have the wrong base case for setting up the chain reaction. So in this case, a base case, so if, if you have proved P of 5, you would set up a chain reaction. Okay. That would allow you to conclude from 5 onwards, and you could prove these separately. But this is the wrong base case. So induction gone wrong, either you know wrong 
or no base case. Or you haven't proved all the leaves. Imagine, you know, when you made this argument, you must not assume anything about n other than the fact that it's bigger than or equal to 5. If you only prove this link for 5, 6, and 7, you don't have this link. And not having this link breaks the infinite chain reaction. So you have to establish the wrong or no base case or not all links proved. So in either of those cases, the induction is just wrong. There's no way to resurrect it except for you know, getting the right base case and proving all the links. Okay. So now, with the principle of induction in hand, let me show you how induction works in terms of what's the induction proof mechanics. And we'll use the induction proof mechanics to prove exactly this claim. Okay. So now we are ready to prove this claim. And so we usually say proof by induction. And this tells the whole world that you're about to use the induction principle, okay, the principle of induction. And so what you're going to do is you're going to establish the base case and you're, you're going to establish the induction step, which is an infinite chain of implications for all n greater equal to 1. And once you have done that, the principle of induction allows you to conclude it's true for all n greater equal to 1 and you're done. So, it, it's usually helpful to restate the predicate. So, let's restate the predicate. So, our predicate, our claim is P of n is the claim that 4 to the n minus 1 is divisible by 3. Okay. And now the proof is by induction of this uh, claim for all n greater equal to 1. So, let's establish the base case. P of 1 is the claim that 4 to the 1 minus 1 is divisible by 3. Okay, what is that saying? That's saying that 4 minus 1, which is 3, is divisible by 3. That's clearly true. So P of 1 is true. Okay, that's the first step in the principle of induction. Now comes the complicated step usually. So this is called the base case. And this is called the induction step. Okay. Now we have to prove, must show... P of n implies P of n plus 1 for all n greater than or equal to 1. So that basically means we can't assume anything about n, so we have to prove it for a general n, okay, except that we can assume that n is bigger than or equal to 1. Now, this is the proof of an implication. So we have to use one of the methods for proving implication. Now, we have two methods. We have the direct method and or you can use contraposition. But it's important to make sure that you use one of these proof methods to prove an implication. And when, okay, so we're going to use the direct method here. So in using the direct method here, and that's by far the most popular, the most common type of induction step is the direct proof of an implication. So what are we going to do? With the direct method, we assume that this left-hand side is true. So we get to assume P of N is true. Well, what is that assumption? That's the assumption okay, that for to the n minus 1 is divisible by 3. We must prove, must show, show the right-hand side is true. That's why. Because that's the mechanics of a direct proof. They must show that p of n plus 1 is true. Okay, why? Because that's the mechanics of a direct proof. And p of n plus 1 is the right-hand side of this implication. What? What must we show? We must show that 4 to the power n plus 1 minus 1 is divisible by 3. Ah, interesting. Okay. So, you know, we start with the left-hand side being true. We get to assume this. What does that mean? That means that 4 raised to the power n minus 1 is a multiple of 3 if it's divisible by 3. So it's 3k. Or this means that 4 to the n is equal to 3k plus 1. Okay. Now, that's the beginning of the proof of this implication. We know where the end is. The end must be to show that 4 to the n, my, n plus 1 minus 1 is divisible by 3. So that's the end of the proof. And so, you know, I must end the proof by showing, therefore, p of n plus 1 is true. Okay, so that's the end. So it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of cool that I know where I'm going. I know what the end of a direct proof must look like. 
Okay. And, I, and I'm here currently, and I need to go here, which is, a, which is a claim about 4 to the n plus 1. I have 4 to the n, and this is the creative step in an induction, okay. is to link what we were allowed to assume that 4 to the n is equal to 3k plus 1. We have to link that to where we are going. Okay. We know what we are allowed to assume. We know where we are going. So hopefully creating that link is not too hard. Okay. In this case, it's not too hard at all. Because look, I'm interested in an expression involving 4 to the n plus 1. So I have 4 to the n. So I can just multiply both sides by 4. So multiply by 4. Okay. And that gives me 4 to the n plus 1 is equal to, multiply this side by 4, 12k plus 4. Or, if I, if I subtract 1 from both sides, 4 to the n plus 1 minus 1 is equal to 12k plus 3. Okay. But that is equal to 3 times 4k plus 1. Mm. So 4 to the n plus 1 minus 1 is a multiple of 3. 4 to the n plus 1 minus 1 is divisible by 3. Mm. And that's exactly the claim. Therefore, p of n plus 1 is true. 4 to the n plus 1 minus 1 is divisible by 3. Okay. And that is the end of the proof. Actually, typically we'll say, therefore, p of n plus 1 is true. So, by induction, p of n is true for all n greater or equal to 1. And here we're invoking the principle of induction because we've shown 1 and we've shown 2. Okay, now some notation. So this is the base case, this is the induction step, and typically this assumption that we make that P of n is true, this is sometimes called the induction hypothesis. Okay. So in any induction proof, and we're going to see more examples, in any induction proof, it is absolutely necessary to have the base case. If not, your proof has gone wrong. It's absolutely imperative to prove the implication without making any assumptions about n except that n is greater than or equal to 1. So in other words to prove it for a general n. And you can prove this implication using either a direct proof or a contraposition proof. Here we use the direct proof. So this is the direct proof. Okay. Now let me emphasize, let me emphasize that in the induction step, in the induction step, you must prove P of n implies P of n plus 1 for all n greater or equal to 1. For all n greater or equal to 1. Okay. So, in other words, effectively I'm proving infinitely many things. For n equals 1, I have to prove this implication. For n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. And the way I do it is by not making any assumptions about n, by treating n as a general n. Okay. And then you might wonder, well, hmm, so I have to prove infinitely many things. So why don't I just forget about induction and just prove p of n for all n bigger than or equal to 1 from the get-go? Because that's also proving an infinite number of things. p of 1 proof, prove p of 1, prove p of 2, prove p of 3, you know, using a general n. Okay. And that is the power of induction. It's the fact that you don't have to prove P of N, which is typically hard. You have to prove an implication, and proving an implication is much, much easier than proving the original claim. And why is that? It's much easier to prove an implication, and that's because in the proof of an implication, that's reasoning without facts. So we don't need to know if P of N is true or false. P of N plus 1 is true or false. We have to prove just a link. And, and the way that materializes in the proof is that we get to make an assumption. So to prove an implication, we get to make the assumption that this is true. And that's a huge bonus. Okay? It gives us something to work with. Something to start at gives us something to start at and make our way towards P of n plus 1. Because we only need to prove the link. Okay, it's much easier to prove the link because we get somewhere to start at. Okay, now, yes, we have to prove infinitely many links, so we do it for a general n. But it's much easier to prove a link than P of n. Okay, but there's a price for this much easier proof of a link. And what's the price? Well, it's usually a very small price. We've added the need 
to prove p of one, the base case. There's no base case here. You just prove them directly if you want. Okay, but induction says, you know, you don't need to prove them all directly. You can prove the link, okay, and then the base case. And you're done. And the link is much easier to prove. Okay, let's do some examples. Erase first using speed erase. Okay, and in these examples that we're doing, we're going to see that, you know, induction can be used to prove incredibly general things, sums, inequalities, divisibility, and even more complex things about, you know, strange looking problems that seem to have nothing to do with math. Okay, yet induction is the way to prove it. So let's erase, and then get back to some examples. Okay, now for some examples, and let's start with a very famous sum. Okay, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus up to plus 100. Okay, now <laughs> up to 100, we might be able to add it up. And a, and a teacher, you know, interacting with the great Gauss, a giant of mathematics, was fed up with this guy. He was always, you know, you know up to stuff. And so the teacher said, I'm going to occupy you, you know, for a while. Please add up 1 to 100. The number is 1 to 100, you know, and the teacher was on his way out thinking, you know, he's occupied Gauss. Before the teacher got to the door, Gauss shouts out 50-50. Okay, so this is 50-50. And we may wonder, well, how the heck did Gauss get that so quickly? No doubt, Gauss computed a formula for this sum. Okay. Now, here's a heuristic derivation of the formula. This is probably something along the lines of what Gauss did. And it's, it's, it's really ingenious what Gauss did. So, you know, and, and let's even make it more general. Why do we need to add up to 100? Let's add up to n. So let's bring algebra in. So we're interested in the sum s equals 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus up to plus n. Okay, so what Gauss might have done. Is he said, you know what? I know about math. You can add things in any order you want. So let me reverse. So s equals n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus all the way up to plus 1. So I reverse them. 1, 2, 3 up to n. Well, now let me add. So you know, if I add, I got 2s here equals n plus 1. n minus 1 plus 2 is n plus 1. n minus 2 plus 3 is n plus 1. Look, they're all n plus 1. And this is also n plus 1. Okay, so I've got a whole bunch of n plus 1s, which I need to add up. How many n plus 1s do I have? I have n of them. So this is n times n plus 1. And there, with some even simpler algebra, Gauss concludes that the sum s is equal to 1 half n, n plus 1. Genius. Okay. Not only can he compute now the sum up to 100, he can compute for any n. Okay, but do we believe this argument? It's got a dot, 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 fill in the blanks. Okay. Okay. So we might believe the formula, but this argument we may suspect because, you know, is that a proof? Okay, so let's prove it by induction. And now that's with the principle of induction in our back pockets, that's golden. Okay, so let's prove, let's, so, so let's first make a claim. P of n is the claim. Okay, so there's a claim involving n. Now this is a fairly sophisticated claim. It's the claim that the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus plus n is equal to 1 half n n plus 1. That's the claim. Okay, and we might think, hmm, you know, are we allowed to use this dot, dot, dot? Well, later on, we'll see a formal notation for this. Sometimes, you know, once, once you learn that notation, we don't need the dot, dot, dot. We write this as the sum from i equals 1 to n of i. Okay, but for the moment, you know, you know let's take this informal notation for the sum. Okay. So, this is what Gauss claimed. Now let's prove it by induction. So proof by induction. Okay, now whenever you prove by induction, you know, you first establish the base case. So first step, base case, P of 1. Is it true? Well, what is the claim in P of 1? It's the claim that 1 plus up to n equals 1. So that's just 1. 1 is equal to 1 half, so n equals 1, times 1, times 1 plus 1, which is 2. So that's 2 times 1 plus a half, that's 2 times a half, that's 1. So this is 1. Check. So P of 1 is true. Clearly P of 1 is true. Okay, now comes the tricky part. Now we have to prove that P of n implies P of n plus 1 for all n greater or equal to 1. This is setting up the infinite chain. Okay. So in any such induction step, because we're proving an implication, we get to assume... Okay, P of n, okay. and that's the claim that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus up to plus n is equal to 1 half n, n plus 1. And now comes the tricky part. We have to prove P of n plus 1. So we have to prove 
p of n plus 1. Okay, you have to show p of n plus 1. Now, it's tricky because you need to figure out what is this claim, and you have to be careful in plugging n plus 1 into the claim. So this is the claim, okay, 1 plus 2. See here, n appears here, n appears here, n appears here. And wherever n appears in the claim, we have to replace it with n plus 1. So this is the claim, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus, plus n plus n plus 1. So we have to go up to n plus 1. This n tells you where the sum goes up to. So the sum has to go up to n plus 1, and it's going to equal 1 half. Now, p of n says it's equal to 1 half n, n plus 1. So p of n plus 1, we plug in n plus 1 here and n plus 1 here. So we get n plus 1 time, uh, times n plus 1 plus 1. Okay. Well, if we wanted, we could simplify. This is 1 half n plus 1 times n plus 2. Okay. But that's, you know, we've, we've done it right. We've gotten the claim p of n plus 1. Now, it's just a question of, we get to assume this, and we must prove this. So what did we get to assume? We get to assume this. So we get to assume that, you know, um, 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n is equal to 1 half n, n plus 1. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus, plus up to n is equal to 1 half n, n plus 1. Now, the nice thing about proving an implication is we know where we are going. We have to prove this which is the claim, which is, which is the claim p of n plus 1. We have to prove that p of n plus 1 is true. So we know where we're going. So we're interested in this sum, but with one more term added, which is n plus 1. So from here, we can conclude that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus, plus n plus n plus 1. So I've added n plus 1 to this side, and that's the key step. Okay, It's what's linking what I'm allowed to assume to where I'm going. And that's usually the hard part of an induction. So this plus n plus 1, well, if I add n plus 1 to this side, I had better add it to the, the, this side. So it has to equal 1 half n, n plus 1 plus n plus 1. Okay. And now it turns out it's just baby algebra. Okay. So I can factor out n plus 1. So this is equal to 1 half n plus 1 okay, times, okay, so... I have 1 half n plus 1, so I factored out 1 half n plus 1, I get n plus, I get, you know, uh, plus 2. Because, you know, 1 half n plus 1 times 2, the 2 cancels that half and gives me this n plus 1. Okay, but this is exactly 1 half n plus 1, n plus 1 plus 1, which is what I wanted. Check. So we conclude, therefore, p of n plus 1 is true. Okay, and that's always where the direct proof has to end. Okay, You have to end by showing that what you were asked to show is true. Okay. And so by induction, P of N is true for all N greater or equal to 1. End of proof. And what is P of N? It's the claim that the sum is equal to this formula. So there, we've used induction to prove a formula. Now I want to show you some typical errors, or one typical error, that occurs very often in this kind of a proof. Okay. And notice here that I started with my assumption P of n, and I somehow massaged it to P of n plus 1. Okay. Now, a lot of people, and this is an error, start with, you know, the claim they're trying to prove, and, the lo and their logic goes like this. Let's see see what happens if, you know, p of n plus 1 is true. So let me assert p of n plus 1 to be true. So let me assert this. So let's see what happens if, you know, let's see what happens if I assert p of n plus 1. Okay, so what am I asserting? I'm, I'm claiming as if it's true, you know, the sum up to n plus 1, 2 plus 3 plus up to plus n plus 1 plus n plus n plus 1. Let's see what happens if I assert that this is equal to what I want. It's equal to 1 half n plus 1 n plus 2. Okay. Okay, then, you know, let me subtract n plus 1 from both sides. So that's perfectly legitimate. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up to plus n. So I've subtracted n plus 1 from here. That should equal 1 half n plus 1 n plus 2 minus n plus 1. 
Okay, and now let's do some basic algebra. That's equal to one half n plus one. So I'll factor out, you know, one half n plus one. Okay, and now I'm going to get in here n plus two. So that's this term. Okay, and I'm going to get a minus two. So the minus two cancels out with this two. So one half n plus one times minus two gives me minus n plus one. So that's basic algebra. And now let me simplify n plus two minus two is n. So this is one half n, n plus one. And whew, I have such a large amount of relief here because look, you know, by, 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 by sort of asserting where I want to go is true, I have managed to derive something which I know is true because I assumed it's true. So whew, nothing bad happened. This is known to be true, so nothing bad happened. And so therefore that means that where I started must be true and that's the end of the proof. Therefore I have proved P of n plus one. And you know, I'm going to emphasize that that is wrong. Okay. So wrong. Okay. Never do that. This is the sure way to get a zero on an induction proof. Okay, you can never assert what you want to prove as though it's true. That's what you have to prove. Okay, and in this flawed proof, what you have done is you have asserted what you want to prove as true, and you have proved what you already know to be true by assumption. So you've accomplished nothing. Okay. Now, I want to emphasize, you can never assert what you want to be true and then derive something that you know to be true and then, you know, ex ex you know give a sigh of relief and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm great. I, I, I didn't do some, I didn't get somewhere that's nonsense. So where I started must be true. Okay. And I want to emphasize this and I want to tell you that, you know, this method of proving the implication is just flat wrong. And I want to show you an example, which is of the same type. And when I show you this example, you'll have no doubt that it's wrong. Okay. So I'm going to prove to you that 4 equals 7. Okay. And that's what I want to prove. Okay. So, 4 equals 7. That's what I want to prove. Okay. So, mm, well, you know, now I'm going to do all kinds of cool stuff. Okay. I'm going to do stuff that I'm allowed to do. Forget about the fact that I'm not allowed to write this down. I'm going to do cool stuff that I'm allowed to do. So, well, you know, if 4 equals 7, then 7 equals 4. Because we learned... You know that if A equals B, then B equals A. Equality is, is what's called, you know, symmetric. Okay. Well, but then we also learn that if you have two equations, you can add. So this plus this equals that plus that. Look, so 11, so 7 plus 4 adding is equal to 4 plus 7 adding. So this means that 11 equals 11. Okay, subtracting, and then I, and I, and I come to 11 equals 11, and I say, oh, wow, sigh of relief. You know, I've derived something that I know is true. Just like here, I derived something that I know is true. So therefore, I must have started somewhere true. False! False, false, false! Okay. You cannot start where you want to prove, okay, and then do real stuff, valid stuff, and end up at something that's known to be true, and then therefore claim that where you started is true. It certainly cannot be done here, and it cannot be done here. So don't do it. Bad proof. Now, I want to, you know, um, illustrate the problem with induction. Okay. And it's a real problem. And maybe you've noticed this problem with induction. Okay. So the problem, the problem with induction. Okay. You might have noticed it. And, you know, let's just imagine, okay, that I'm not the great Gauss and I didn't come up with this formula one half n n plus one. Okay, so the question is, where did I get that formula from? Okay. So where did the formula come from? And this is the, the, the sort of drawback of induction. 
Okay. Induction is not a derivation. Okay. So where did the formula 1 plus 2 plus up to plus n equals 1 half n, n plus 1? Where did it come from? Okay. Did I just get it out of nowhere? Well, no. I had the great Gauss who showed me that method of heuristically deriving that formula. Induction is not a derivation. Okay. It's a proof of this formula and it can only go once you have something to prove, once you have the formula to prove. Okay. But where did the formula come from? Well, you have to somehow get the formula okay, and then you can prove it with induction. So that is the drawback with induction. It doesn't give me the formula. It gives me the method to prove the formula. So then where do I get the formula from? Well, you know, somehow I must get the formula. So in some sense, you know, I won't be able to prove a, an untrue formula. So in some sense, I must get a formula that's true. Okay, so it's kind of circular. I must get a formula that's true, and then I'm going to use induction to prove it's true. Circular. Mm. Problem. Okay. So, the fundamental thing about induction is that it gives you a method to prove something. It doesn't give you the thing, the formula, or whatever it is that you are to prove. Okay. But all is not lost, because what you can do is come up with a guess. And once you have a guess, you can use induction to prove that the guess is true. Okay, so you can prove the guess with induction. So that's where typically induction is used. Is that, you know, we, we get a guess, but a guess is not a proof. And then we use induction to prove the guess. And how do you get the guess? Tinkering! Okay, so to get a guess to prove by induction, Tinker. Okay. Very important. And now to see how that would work in a situation where, you know, it's not obvious what a formula is, as in, uh, uh, you, you know, using techniques, for example, that were used by the great Gauss, you know, try to compute, try to guess a formula for the sum of the squares. So S is equal to 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared plus dot 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 up to n squared. Okay, now it's, there's no immediate formula for this, so we have to make an educated guess. Okay, and you know, the book illustrates a method called the method of differences, which allows us to get, you know, is a reasonable method for getting guesses for formulas like this. That guess is not a proof, okay, and then once you have the guess, you can use induction to prove it. So, I encourage you to go through the entire process of sort of guessing the formula by tinkering. So you try S for N equals 1, N equals 2, and so on and so forth. Try to come up with a guess. And then induction can be used to prove the guess is true. Okay. So the power of induction is not in getting you the formula. It's in proving the formula is true. You have to guess to get the formula. And in order to get a reasonable guess that has a high chance of being true, you have to have to tinker. Okay. Now, you know, what I want to do is I want to show you a, 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 a link between induction and well-ordering. And in doing that, we'll do another example where we, you know, prove an inequality instead of a sum or instead of, you know, a divisibility issue. And la I'll end, you know, um, um, on that note, okay, by, by showing you the link between induction and, uh, and uh, um, the well-ordering principle. Okay, so let's erase the board. Okay, so let's use induction to prove an inequality. Okay, so the inequality we're going to prove is that n is less than 2 to the n for all n uh, greater or equal to 1. Okay, so proof by induction. And the predicate is the, the predicate is the claim p of n is the claim n is less than two to the n. Okay. Now I'll go quickly because induction. Now we've had some examples. So the first step is the base case p of one, which claims that one is less than two to the one, which is two to the one is two. So one is clearly less than two to the one. So that's clearly true. So p of one is true. No problem here. Okay. Now the induction step. We must prove that p of n implies p of n plus 1. Okay, so in proving this uh, link, this implication link, we can assume p of n. So that's the claim that n is less than 2 to the n, and we must prove p of n plus 1. So now we must, you, you, will, all, you will often, or oh, it's 
fairly easy to make a mistake when you plug in n plus 1 into the claim n. You must make sure to plug in n plus 1 for every instance of n. So this is the claim n plus 1 is less than 2 to the n plus 1. Okay, so let's prove. So we get to assume this. So we get to start here. n is less than 2 to the n. And we know where we're going. Since we're going, so that's the key step to somehow link where we get to start to where we get to go. But in this case, it's relatively easy because look, I have n, I want n plus 1. So n plus 1, adding 1 to both sides of an inequality is valid. Just like you can add 1 to both sides of an equality. So n plus 1 is less than 2 to the n plus 1. But since n is bigger than or equal to 1, n is bigger or equal to 1, that means that you know 2 to the n is bigger or equal to uh, <coughs> uh, 2, okay? which is certainly bigger or equal to 1. Okay, so I've raised to the power 2. So I can always replace this side of this inequality by something large. So I can replace this 1 by 2 to the n. So this is, you know, um, which is, this is larger than 1. So this is certainly less than 2 to the n plus 2 to the n. I can replace this 1 by something larger. And this here is equal to 2 times 2 to the n, which is 2 to the n plus 1. So I've concluded that n plus 1 is less than 2 to the n plus 1. n plus 1 is less than 2 to the n plus 1. Bingo! Okay, and that's where I want it to be. There, i.e., therefore, p of n plus 1 is true. Concluding my proof, okay? I'm, I'm showing that what I started out to show, that p of n plus 1, I wanted to prove p of n plus 1. I, I'm just simply stating that, look, I've shown it. And that concludes the proof. So by induction, p of n is true for all n greater or equal to 1. Fantastic. Now we're experts at proof by induction. Okay, let me show you another proof, and this time I'm going to use the well-ordering principle. And essentially anything can, that can be proved by induction can be proved by the well-ordering principle because the well-ordering principle and induction are basically equivalent. And in fact, we can prove the principle of induction from the well-ordering principle. So let me just illustrate that with an example by showing that I can prove this claim for all n using the well-ordering principle without using induction. Okay. So proof using well-ordering. Remember what the well-ordering principle was. It was that any subset, any set containing only natural numbers must have a minimum. Okay. So there are two ideas to this proof. The first is it's essentially a contradiction proof. Okay, so it's essentially a contradiction proof. And the basic idea is to say that, you know, you know I'm going to imagine that this is not true for all n. Okay? So it means that there's, there are counterexamples to this claim. And then I'm going to consider the smallest counterexample and get a contradiction. Okay. And the smallest or the existence of this smallest counterexample is where the well-ordering principle comes in. So it's based on a contradiction proof that uses what's, what, what, we, what, what we sometimes call the smallest counterexample. Just to show you a well-ordering proof. We usually prefer induction. It's systematic. It's straightforward. But just to show you that induction didn't pop out of nowhere, it, it, can, it pops out of the well-ordering principle. So, okay. so we want to prove n is less than 2 to the n. So contradiction says assume it's not true. So con proof by contradiction. Contradiction. Okay, assume it is not true. So there exists an n for which so there's some n for which this fails. So n must be greater or equal to 2 to the n. Okay. Let's collect in a bad set all such n. So let's define a bad set, which is you know, n1, n2, n3, dot, dot, dot. So I don't know how big this set is. I don't even know what n are in there. But I know there's at least one, because we're assuming that this claim is not true you know, for all n greater or equal to 1. So there must be at least one. So it's a non-empty set, okay? and it contains only natural numbers. So it must have a minimum. It must have a smallest n in B. So consider let the smallest number in B, B, N, 
star. And this we know must exist in B because it's not empty. It contains only integers. I mean, sorry, it contains only natural numbers, and that's the well ordering principle. It says that there must be a minimum. That's the well ordering principle. So that's what gives us this smallest counter example. Okay. Now, n star is not equal to 1. Why? Because we can explicitly verify that 1 is not a counter example because 1 is less than 2. That's kind of like the base case in the induction. Okay, n star is not equal to 1 because 1 is less than 2 to the 1. So that means that n star is greater or equal to 2. Okay, now if n star is greater or equal to 2, then n star divided by 2 is greater or equal to 1. Okay, I'm just you know showing you that half of n star is greater or equal to 1. Okay. So we found this smallest counterexample, and remember it's a proof by contradiction, so we're exploring this world where the claim is not true, and I'm looking for a contradiction, and here it comes. Okay, let me consider the, 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 the number n star minus 1. Now we know that this is greater or equal to 1, because n star is greater or equal to 2. So this is greater or equal to 1, okay, but n star minus 1 is also greater or equal to um, n star minus n star over 2. Okay. And why do I know that? Well, that's what this is saying. This is saying that n star over 2 is greater or equal to 1. So here I'm subtracting 1. Here I'm, sub I'm subtracting something bigger than 1. So if I subtract something bigger than 1, I must get something less. Okay. So n star minus 1 is greater or equal to well, this guy. Okay. Well, but this we know from algebra is equal to n star over 2, so 1 minus a half is a half, okay? And now we know, because n star is a counterexample, okay, it must be the case that n star is greater or equal to 2 to the n star. So this is greater or equal to 2 to the n star over 2. Okay, so n star has to be greater or equal to 2 to the n star because it's a counterexample. In particular, it's the smallest counterexample. But this is exactly equal to 2 to the n star minus 1. So I'll put in parentheses here n star minus 1, which is bigger than or equal to 1. And n, we just proved that n star minus 1 is bigger than or equal to 2 to the n star minus 1. Now, but wait a minute. That means that n star minus 1, which we know is a number bigger than or equal to 1, n star minus 1 is also a counterexample. So n star minus 1 is also a counterexample. But more importantly, it's smaller than n star. That's very, very fishy. Fishy. Why? Because we just argued that n star is the smallest counterexample. So then how is it possible that there's an even smaller counterexample? It cannot be possible. It's fishy. N star cannot be the smallest counterexample. So we've landed at the fishy position that we were looking for. And since we have gotten to some nonsense, okay, it means that our original assumption, okay, that there exists an N for which N is greater than equal to, that must be false, which proves the original claim, okay, because we have come to the contradiction. That's the end of the proof. There does not exist, there does not exist an n for which, you know, n is greater or equal to 2 to the n. It means that for all n, it must be the case that n is less than 2 to the n. And that's the end of the proof. Okay, so that's just to show you that, you know, we can do anything that we can do with induction, we can do with the well-ordering principle and using contradiction and the, and the idea of the smallest counterexample. In fact, we can prove the principle of induction using the well-ordering principle, but I won't get into those details. Instead, let me show you an interesting problem. Okay, just to show you that, you know, induction can be used to prove things that look like they have nothing to do with mathematics. Okay. So, consider a ring. Okay, so here's a ring. Okay, and on this ring, I'm going to draw some number of red dots and, and, and an equal number of blue dots. Okay, so I'm going to draw some red dots. In this case, I'm going to draw, you know, 
six red dots, and I'm going to draw an equal number of blue dots. So an equal number of blue dots. One, two, three, you know, four, five, six. Okay. Now, I'm going to start a tour around this ring. Okay. And, you know, let's imagine that I start at a blue point, okay. or just before a blue point. Okay. And as I go around the ring, I'm going to count up, you know, how many blue points have I passed and how many red points have I passed. So imagine that I start my tour at this spot. Okay. And I'm going to go all the way around. Okay. And I'm going to end up back here. And okay. So initially I've not passed any points. So I'm going to go this in this direction. Okay. And initially I've not passed any points. Okay, so the way I'll, uh, the way I'll uh, denote that is I passed zero blue points and zero red points. Okay. Now, once I pass this point, I've passed one blue point and zero red points. Okay. Once I pass, pass this point, I've passed two blue points and zero red points. Okay. And then once I pass this point, I've now passed two blue points and one red point. And then once I pass this point, I have now passed um, um, two blue points and two red points. Okay. And now once I pass this point, I have passed three blue points and two red points. Once I pass this point, I have passed three blue points and three red points. Okay. And once I pass this point, I pass four and three red. Once I pass this point, I pass five and uh, um, uh, three red. And once I pass this point, I pass five and four red. Once I pass this point, I pass five blue and five red. And once I pass this point, I pass six blue and five red. And once I pass this point, I have passed six red and six blue. And I end up, you know, coming back to my starting point okay, at this point. So I've gone around and I've kept track as I go around of how many blue points do I pass and how many red points do I pass. And one thing you will observe is that by starting here, okay, the number of blue points I have passed is always at least as large as the number of red points I have passed. Okay, so the number, number of blue points I have passed is always at least the number of red points. Now, that's because I chose this very special starting point. Okay. If, I, if I chose a different starting point, for example, if I started here, immediately I pass a red point and the red points exceed the blue points. Okay. So it's not true that the number of blue points is at least the number of red points uh, no matter where I start. But there's a special point to start where this is true. And so the question is, no matter how you arrange the red and blue points, and no matter how many red points there are, providing there are as many blue points, is it always possible to find such a special starting point? Is it always possible? to find such a special starting point? Okay. Turns out the answer is yes. We can put 10,000 red and 10,000 blue and I'll be able to find a special starting point. Okay, but then the question is how to prove it and you can use induction to prove it. The first thing when you approach a problem like this with, in, with induction is to identify your claim, P of N. And in this case, we can make the claim, P of N is the claim, that if there are N red and N blue, so that's where the N comes in, if there are N red and N blue, it's always possible to find this uh, a special starting point. Okay, now you need to prove that P of 1 is true. That's relatively easy. You now need to prove that P of N implies P of N plus 1. That's the tricky one. But if you can prove that P of N implies P of N plus 1, boom, induction tells you it's always possible. Okay, and here's an example of a problem that we can prove with induction. That doesn't look anything mathematical. And that should sort of illustrate 
you know, how induction is so powerful. And in fact, it's instrumental in proving things about recursions, about dynamic programs, about greedy algorithms, I mean, all kinds of things. Okay. And so, you know, if you can master induction, man, woo, you are there. Okay. So try to solve this problem by induction. Okay. If you solve it by induction, man, you are there. Okay. But if you cannot, it's in the book. We, 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 we go through this problem carefully in the book and you can see how you can use induction to prove such strange things and you can use induction to prove all kinds of things. Signing off.